Welcome to Quiver Financial's market update for October 2023, where we're going to discuss what's hot and what's not in the stock market, energy and metals, inflation, and it's been a while since we've talked about real estate, so why don't we throw that in as well. I'm Colby McFadden, and I'm joined by my esteemed colleagues, Justin Singletary and Patrick Moorhead. Gentlemen, welcome. It has been quite a while since we've gotten together, and uh, a lot's happened you know, in the last couple of months. I think, uh, Justin, you had some exciting news of getting married, so congratulations. It's, Thank I, you. It's a bit... It's it's a big thing to move out of your mom's house and marry your sister. So congratulations. <laughs> well, I succeeded in both. <laughs> yeah, when when are you moving to uh, the south with your sister? <laughs> uh, December. <laughs> well, perfect. That's good. We're, we're going to go where every, where it's acceptable to be married to your sister. <laughs> yeah, you'll find the right place. <laughs> All right, so there's a lot that has gone on since um, we really all got together March, April, May time frame. Um, so let's let's start off with the conversation, gentlemen, with the stock market because that's the thing we get the most questions about. That's what people want to talk about, um, and I think that's going to be a lot of activity in the stock market in the fourth quarter of this year. So it's definitely worth talking about. So I'm going to go back to go forwards, you know, to figure out where you're at. Sometimes you got to look at where you've been. And remind everybody that really since December, so it's amazing, it's you know, almost 10 months, but since September or December, excuse me, uh, of 2022, we've been postulating that the stock market's been in a bear market rally, meaning that it made a low in October of 2022, has been going up in price, but we didn't feel it was going to go beyond its old all-time highs, which were around 4,800 on the S&P 500, if I'm right. You guys might want to double check that for me. Um, so just, you know, here, and we had said that, that we thought the market was going to rally to about 44 to 4,600 on the S&P below the old all-time highs, and then eventually fail. So here's the chart that we shared multiple times from December on. Um, and gentlemen, where, where did this rally that started in October look like it's peaked out. At least recently, it's peaked out where? Somewhere around what? What was it? Anybody? 4,600? Yeah. 4,600. Yeah. So so at the high end of the range. Um, and so, you know, the question has come up from some people. Well, you know, what, what makes you so confident? about the uh the, you know about this being a bear market rally because a lot of people in the last few weeks you know as you got into june and july a lot of people were getting really bullish especially with the action in nvidia and apple and what they call the magnificent seven you know the apple nvidia microsoft that like they were moving the whole market and a lot of people that were making money on those things in the nasdaq we're getting really bullish in, in, in July. And in, in August, we put out a little update saying, hey, we still believe that this is a bear market rally because we were seeing these inner market divergences that were, hey, when we see this S&P 500 rally back almost to its all-time highs, but the higher risk components of the market, which should lead that rally, weren't. So what are those things like junk bonds? So I learned a long time ago that when institutional investors are feeling frisky and it's a bull market with legs, they're going to lead that investment thesis with junk bonds and small caps. So we were seeing that the, you know, the small caps didn't rally anywhere like the S&P 500. Same with the small caps. And financials um, seemed to be leading the downside when the market started to turn at the end of July. So where are we now, gentlemen? Oops. Excuse me. Um, so now where are we is, you know, are those divergences still there? Absolutely. Um, in fact, now that the S&P 500 has broken this trend line, you can see how junk bonds, small caps are leading to the downside along with, with financials. So this is leading me to believe that, yeah, our call, um, our call that this is a, a bear market rally um, has been accurate. And it means that the future for the stock market, and it's not going to go in one direction, but, but the future over the near term um, looks like the momentum ha has changed from up to down. 
So I threw this chart in there for everybody because um, this week or last week we did break a trend line that that when you break these trend lines, it's kind of indicative that the short term momentum has stalled. Um, so I threw some targets up there of where we could go. Um, so what do you guys think? I mean, what um, what what are you what are your feelings about the stock market and, and our call on being a bear market rally? Um, are you still confident in that or are you are you feeling otherwise? Well, a lot of this coincides, you know, the Fed's raising interest rates, which we'll get into in a little bit, but they're also rolling off their balance sheet. And if you yeah. look at how much they've reduced their balance sheet, it kind of coincides with the top of the market of the 4,600 and on down to this. So if they continue to try and do that, you know, the, the days of the QE of propping the market up, now they're just deflating the market, bringing that back down. So it gives us a little more emphasis of, of that. And, and this bear market, you know, to the high end of the 4,600, like we said, part of it is from that AI push. You know, the, a lot of that NASDAQ stuff was supposed to roll off back in June. And because of the NVIDIA and the AI bubble and, and all that type of thing that's happened, you know, time and time again of a new bubble that's come in, pushed the market much higher than it should have. So we've overstretched on the, the bear market rally side. Yeah, you bring up an interesting point that the like the liquidity factor, like what pushes the stock market higher is liquidity. And and if you have the Fed rolling off their balance sheet, basically doing quantitative tightening, um, that has a negative effect to the liquidity. Um, and what's amazing here, too, and Justin, and I've talked about this quite a bit recently, is in this same time frame, you've had a crazy yen carry trade like the the yen has been incredibly weak against the dollar. Um, and that's another form of providing liquidity to a market. Um, and that even with that, I mean, there's been a huge advantage on the yen to carry trade and it market wasn't able to get to new highs. So you can see that the, the liquidity factors between central banks, they're not coordinating to push things higher. They really are trying to, you know, create more of a stagflation scenario where, um, you know, you, you, you get a balancing out of, of all these factors. So it's yeah, I, I would say that's a good, 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 good observation on your part. Yeah, my only ad here would just be that um, you know I think we actually sell off probably down to forty two hundred, probably a little bit of a cooling off period there for you know maybe a little bit of a rally or bounce, but I, I think after mm -hmm. that we hit that target one probably another cooling off stage where there's you know perhaps a little bit of consolidation and then off to target two. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the, clearly last week and this week, and based on like what Patrick had brought up, there's a lot of negative aspects to the overall market. One thing to point out, you've mentioned all the, throughout the last year and uh, this year in, in our videos is the little tag there, it says expanded flats. And if you look at you know, what was it, February, March of 2022, and then where we are today. Mm -hmm. So maximum frustration to the maximum number of participants. You know, we talked about being trading in a range, and that's pretty much what it's done for just over a year. Yeah. Yeah, the, the these expanded flats are nasty, um, and it's been a long time since we've seen one in a big major top. Um, you know, th this is where some experience from 08 comes in, and, and what I saw then and what I experienced then, I'm starting to see again. And so in these expanded flats, what happens is, you know, it wasn't too far back. You know, it, wasn't, it was just right around in this time frame, right in here. People were still really negative the market. You know, people were still thinking the market was going to go break those October lows. Um, and when we broke this resistance here, when we took this last leg up, that's what got everybody who was negative of the market, positive of the market. And that's why these expanded flats, when they fail, they can cascade down really fast because right here, a bunch of people changed their positioning from being short the market to being long the market, and they changed their posturing, right, their belief system, and, you know, put money to work. And if we start breaking below 4,200, this can speed up pretty quickly. Um, it's important to note, too, though, what if we're wrong? You know, Justin, like, what if we get down to 4,200 and, and we grab some footing and we're off to the races to new all-time highs? You know, that, that we always got to think about the flip of the side of the coin. 
I don't think that's a probability, but we have to keep it as a possibility that if this market comes down a little bit lower, then starts to rip towards you know a new all time high, where do you adjust your posturing? And and right now, basically, if you stay below, I, I would say the the line of demarcations is the combination of this upward sloping trend line. That if you're below that, you're probably selling the rips and buy, rather than buying the dips um, and you take that until you know you continue that until another trend line develops somewhere around 4200 and then you can start to use that as your future line of demarcation um, but right now um, it does look like the market wants to go lower so I would lean into it um, and I would my risk management would be I'd reevaluate if we started to get back above 4400 um, that's well, now. Ask me in a month or ask me in two months where I would put my risk management because that will change in the future. Patrick, what uh, do you got? I, yeah, I was going to say that, you know, we, we always try and look at both sides of things. And, you know, a lot of people are probably looking at this is, you know, buy the dip type of deal. It's, it's a risk off there. You know, we have this all the time. You know, the believers that this is not mm -hmm. a bear market rally. We're going to go higher. And I mean, I've tried finding things that would really cause us to rally higher. Like there's really nothing in the data other than, and I just saw an article today about manipulation. You know, the options market has become yeah. so much of the S&P 500 and Correct. there's already the, the manipulation that's kind of, you know, there's no proof because you can't ever track that. It's in the shadow markets, all that type of stuff. But there's a lot of things going on in the option market that shows manipulation that that's really sure. the only thing I've been able to find that could cause this market to turn around either here or in the near, you know, couple next couple of weeks, you know, other than outside just a normal reset rally. But I mean, a lot of the people out there, the pundits are talking that this is just a reset down to the 200 day moving average. You know, we've stretched so far from mm -hmm. the, the 200 that we're yeah. just resetting back. And we'll we'll be rallying. Sure. You know, I I saw uh, what a Goldman Sachs or J.P. Morgan saying we're going to hit all time highs in 2024, which it could happen. Yeah, I saw that recently. Market moves, I could see that, but there's a lot sure. going to happen between now and then. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I, a lot of people could argue we're jumping the gun here because you're only you know four or five percent, six percent off of right. the all time highs. So right, so you, you know, but I'm just telling you, you know, signs are signs. You know, the I fundamentally you brought up a lot of fundamental reasons that that the market from liquidity to all kinds of things that should prevent the market from getting too hot. And then there is this one factor which can happen and has happened in individual names, especially where you could get a coordinated effort from enough institutions in the options market to manipulate or squeeze, you know, an, an index or a stock higher. Um, and if that's the case, then we'll have to adjust. But right now, based on the uh, the homework that I've done, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to continue to to believe that. Uh, what's hot and what's not in 2023 uh, when we come to the end is people are going to look back and say you know what the stock market wasn't nearly as hot in the last half of the year as it was in the first half and the whole year turns out to be pretty much a wash after a bad 2022 right um so what 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 if if you're an investor like or if you have money in your 401k right and you only have stocks and bonds what can you do? And so that's, you know, now you've got to start looking at other areas of the market and say, okay, even though the overall stock market, let's say tech and financials and things like that may not be looking all that hot, hot in the charts or from the fundamentals, um, what's an area that does look good? You know, and, and energy and metals is something we've been on our radar for a while. And the metals, gold, silver, gold miners, I will tell you right now, really, really testing my patience here. I mean, they, they are riding and right on some lines of support that if they don't hold, I'm going to have to change a lot of conversations that I've had the past few months because I've been moving forward that this chart of gold, this chart of silver, um, while they've been trading sideways, that this was a consolidation pattern before moving higher. And we haven't totally broken down of support um but man we are right there i mean it, i mean if there's ever a time that 
you know, one of our calls could be off. Th this is it. So this is one I got to watch really, really closely. The only saving grace that in in my nerves on on betting on silver, gold, and gold miners is that over the last three weeks, there's been so much strength in the U.S. dollar. I mean, the dollar has rallied incredible amounts. I mean, today it was up a half a percent. And in that environment, gold, silver, and gold miners have not broken support. They haven't, they, they haven't been taken out to the woodshed from the dollar's rally. And the dollar's rally is probably coming close to an end. You know, it's gotten parabolic. So I'm really keeping my fingers crossed here that gold and silver and the gold miners grab some footing and start to move higher because um, it's, you know, it's in the portfolio. It's a belief that we've had. Um, and, uh, you know, I like buying things that support. I'm a believer for in it. closing gaps. And yeah, today we point. closed a very important gap on gold. So I think that's, that's why we stretch down so much today. Um, there's yeah. is another gap lower. We could drop down to 170 on gold to close one more gap. Yeah, not every it's gap. Funny you say that. I close. Love... But yeah, I, I'm a strong believer that you know we got to close the gaps. It could take a day. It could take six years. You know who who knows? But I think that we're yeah. that's the reason more so of the pullback than than anything. We got to go back and and reset, and then we'll be that stretch higher. Yeah, this is, I put it right up here on the screen is that you're talking that gap right there. It's yep. funny you bring that up. I was, I was looking at a daily chart of, of gold the last year and I was like, oh shit, there's another gap below. It could go one more step before, you know, probably wash out and get everybody negative and then rip higher. Um, yep. because this is another, this is kind of a, another form of an expanded flat just in a, in a, in a different tilt. Um, so if it if it does get footing and rip higher, it's going to catch a lot of people by surprise and probably you know get a little bit of a short squeeze. Yeah, I mean when we but, talked about man, it before, I, would, I just wish it would start moving now. Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> we that goes on a lot of things. But we were talking the other day, you know, that I'm I still think gold rips. You know, I'm in the same camp as you, but I'm worried that it's not going to maybe rip because you know. With interest rates being high, baby boomers want yield. You know, the people that have been yep. in gold have made nothing for the last, you know, five years, six years, 10 years. So they're going to maybe push more towards bonds, which we'll get into in a little bit and how that could maybe hurt you. But they, they want to lock in and get that yield. And you're not going to get that maybe yield from gold. It might just trade sideways. So it's it, it has that risk That's of baby boomers not wanting to just sit in gold forever. Yeah, it's like a, all assets probably where, you know, it, without momentum, nobody's really paying attention to it um, except for the experts or the professionals. Right. Um, my, my so, yeah, I mean, with. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Pat, or, uh, Colby. No, no, go ahead, Justin. Go right ahead. Uh, I was just going to say my only counter argument to that would be is, uh, though I do agree, um, however, a lot of these baby boomers feel that gold is a as a safe place. So yes, I think a version of them or a portion of them are very concerned about the overall yield of their portfolio and the income that's coming in. However, they still have this old school mentality of gold is safety. Gold is better than the dollar. Sure. You know, it's it's more safer than mm -hmm. being in you, you know, UUP or other assets and they'll feel more comfortable because, you know, in their minds, they're always expecting that the Jim Rickers thing, the end of the world, and we're all going to need, you know, gold bars, mm -hmm. bullets, and butterfingers. <laughs> so sure, exactly. you know, that would yeah. just be my only counter argument to it. Not so much that they don't want the yield, but more that they're kind of an old school mindset of, you know, gold is safety to them. Yeah, you can see it in the marketing. <laughs> well, well, that's a, that's a good point, Pat Patrick. Um, you you can see it in the marketing of gold, right? Yeah, you can see that um, if you want to sell gold and you want to target market, you target people over sixty. You target the baby boomers. Um, there's nobody targeted in marketing gold advertisements to like twenty and thirty year olds. Now, crypto, they are right. You know, and everybody thinks that crypto is going to be you know the the millennials' gold. 
um, yet to be seen. Um, and so, yeah, you're right, Justin, the baby boomers still have an affiliation. I mean, look how many questions we get on a monthly basis. The two top questions are, what do you think is going to happen in the stock market? And should I buy gold? Because I keep getting emails about it. So, yeah, they're definitely. But nobody buys any like like you'll know you'll know when gold is towards the end of the move when everybody else is talking like like every baby boomer is going to want if gold starts to get above two thousand dollars an ounce and it gets twenty two hundred twenty four hundred twenty five hundred. The moment that the news starts talking about it being at all time highs, everybody's going to want to buy. It, right. Um, and, and a perfect example of that is is oil. Right. So so oil looks incredibly hot like we've been we've been big on oil for a while and we've been buying you know uh, exchange traded funds in that oil sector anytime we were around 60 65 bucks a barrel and for for the first half of this year it didn't do us any good whatsoever all right but however in the last two months boom um now gold's you know approaching 90 today it was up three percent i think yeah. um so I mean, I'm sorry, oil, I'm sorry. Uh, oil was up 3% today. So all of a sudden, oil has broken out. And I'm hoping gold and silver break out of their patterns because they're very similar. But oil has broken out of this pattern. And just for geopolitical reasons, all kinds of stuff going into an election year. Um, we've been talking since January that, that we thought oil markets and oil prices were going to be sticky higher um, and probably go to levels that people aren't talking about right now. Not not all at once, right? Um, so we've been owners of oil ETFs, and and I'm trimming them. We we've, we've got profits, so I'm going to tell everybody while while we're oil bulls over the long haul. In the short term, we're trimming. Like I would not be chasing and buying oil after it ran up three percent today, and it's been up predominantly for three months so buy on the next dip like so so in our portfolios we're looking to start to trim these oil and gas positions with the intention to buy them back in the next consolidation phase so um, this i think is one of the hotter areas to continue to watch going into 2024 especially before the uh, the, the election and everything um, you guys got any contrary views or got any, uh, Not anything contrary, you guys want to add to that? constantly changing. We have to keep on it because, I mean, there's two refineries so coming on that are going to increase production by a million dollars a barrel. So that's obviously going to have an impact. Saudi and Russia just cut production by what? Yeah. A, a billion dollars a barrel or a million? Or I don't remember the number. I mean, so, I mean, yeah. that's going to have an effect. So it's that, like you always say, it doesn't go up in a straight line why you know we could mm -hmm. go up to the hundred dollars a barrel 150 like they're talking but it's probably not going to just keep going we're going to have resets you know and, and that type of stuff yeah but i think over the next year two years three years yeah we, we do see that which is not good for our economy it's going to have even a more detrimental effect on our bear market yeah so four million yeah. barrels from that uh, article we shared with each other this morning opec and russia are cutting by four million barrels four million okay so yeah, the million that the two refineries are going to bring are going to do nothing. <laughs> yeah, and those aren't yeah. even I U.S. Mean, refineries; hey. they're they're international refineries. So yeah, yeah, I'm afraid to ask people to drive anywhere in the future um, because you know the implications of this are pretty significant. Um, we already got gas prices here in California at what six six fifty a gallon. Yeah. Um, so you know, and that's I, not don't, even winter, I would, don't yeah well and, and and don't be shocked if if gas prices are you know seven eight bucks a barrel when you get into the first or second quarter of next year um that politically going into an election year that they'll want to release money from or uh, oil from the uh strategic oil reserve you know there'll be all of these kinds of g gimmicks but you know the saudis want this higher um there's a lot of reasons if you want to know all the fundamental and technical reasons why we believe oil is in a longer term bull market um then call us because it's a laundry list um we we put out a piece in in february of our catch the next wave that you can get off our website and our blog that you know covers the thesis that we have there so um this is one of those ones that uh it's we hope we're wrong but it doesn't look like it and by being right it's life is expensive because then you also have food commodities like this is a etf that tracks both oil gold and food commodities 
And this is now broken out to the upside. So we're all going to be spending more money at the gas pump. We're all going to be spending a lot more money at the grocery store if we're not already. I mean, I went in there and just bought some chicken and a couple things. It was like 35 bucks. I was like, are you kidding me? I mean, I just bought for myself, you know, and I eat like a bird. So it's like, whew, man, oh, man, oh, man. So, you know, the implications of energy um, on an, our inflation and then also how it factors into interest rates because you have a situation where a lot of the CP, a lot of the inflation numbers that the government is going to use to track and raise rates or not is affected by energy prices. So, um, you know, I, I keep just telling all our clients that the only thing I can do for you is make money in your portfolio so it offsets what you're spending at the gas pump, right, and at the grocery store. So, you know, I can't help you save money, but I can at least make it back in your portfolio. And I think that's how people need to look at this. Well, and to, to backtrack what you said at the beginning of metals and energy was the 401k portfolios. You know, what, what do 401k portfolios have to invest in? And we, we specialize in the optimization of 401k because they have bonds and they have stocks. Well, all people yeah. have been talking about is interest rates rise. Well, what happens to yeah. bond prices when interest rates rise? So we're, we're having the same effect yeah. that we had in 2022, this last month of stocks dropping, bonds dropping, 401k portfolios getting hammered, and advisors, Fidelity, Morgan Stanley, they're not doing anything. They're not letting their clients know or any of that type of stuff of what they could be going into to combat that. So well, it's a million tough time. 401k for... owners are going to drop to half a million dollar owners. Yeah, it's a tough time for 401k allocators, right? Because not a lot of 401ks give you a lot of options out of stocks and bonds. If they do, if you have a 401k that offers you some sector funds, like we offer a, uh, what we call the Quiver Blue 401k that we purposely designed for environments like this so people can get specific and say, hey, I want gold in my 401k. I want uh, silver. I want oil, you know, so it's attractive you know, the guidance that we're giving people. If you don't have that, um, what you got to do is find out if your 401k has a brokerage window because some 401ks, uh, quite a few of them, especially at larger companies, they'll have a setup with a Schwab or a Fidelity or somebody like that, that you can move a portion of your 401k out of the funds that they offer and put it into the, the brokerage option. And then that opens up a whole world of investment options. And you can even hire somebody to do that for you once you make that transition. So that's something that, again, you know, contact us. We can help you fish around in your 401k to see if that's an option. But it's going to be an important one for people to really research out. Um, you know, because here's interest rates. And, and realize as this goes up, government bond long like bond funds the like bond funds that are in a 401k the bond funds that people usually put in their portfolio to offset the risk of stocks because normally when stocks go down government bonds go up but what happened in 2022 is now starting to happen again whereas the stock market falls interest rates are rising so the bond market's falling too so you're getting whacked on both sides of your portfolio, right? So the only saving grace I can say about interest rates, because this is a chart of the 10-year treasury, is that I can count five waves now. I Like off of the lows in 2020, I can see where interest rates are almost complete with a five-wave pattern, which means that this first impulse higher is coming to an end. I think it might have to get up to 5%. So don't, you know, don't be surprised if we get a squeeze higher here. But after that, we should go through a period of a handful of months where rates kind of subside. We'll go through a consolidation period. And if that's a three-wave pattern that kind of stays maybe above 3%, then we got to really start to watch that. Do we get another five-wave pattern higher? So imagine this. Between, let's say, November to March, interest rates subside a little bit in this three-wave pattern. But at the same time, Energy prices are going higher, inflation numbers are going higher, and the Fed gets forced into having to talk about raising rates when we get into March, April. Like that, that's the kind of fundamental scenario that we don't want to see if you want lower interest rates. So if you're one of these fools, like, I mean, what, did you guys read that text message I sent you? 
I mean, if you're if you're one of these fools listening to a real estate agent saying to you, hey, man, it's a great time. I mean, I got to read this. I mean, this is ridiculous. I I hit up. I hit up this dude on Zillow. OK, this is insane. I, so I hit this guy up on Zillow for a house that's in Laguna Hills. Right. Just curious about it. Seeing like, you know, maybe it would be good for my kids. And 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 you in Zillow, you hit the hey, talk to an agent. And it doesn't go to the agent that is, you know, has the listing. It goes to some guy that buys, you know, some douchebag that buys the leads from Zillow, right? So I talked to the guy for five minutes. He he doesn't know shit about the house. I, he oh, I got to get back to you. I'm like, well, the, why, you know, why even call me if you don't even know what the hell you're talking about? So the guy sends me this message, and it must probably an automated message that Zillow does for him. And it says, "Good morning, it's so and so." You know, "Good morning, it's douchey." Um, Zillow predicts. Zillow predicts that once rates get below 6%, the market is going to go bananas. Most economists believe that now is a great time to buy. Are you on the fence? Is this guy fucking, is this guy kidding me? I mean, was there, you guys tell me, was there, he works for the government. Yeah, he's like my foot surgeon selling me a surgery um, rather than rehab. This is, this is um, you know. a company that lost, what was it, four, two or four billion dollars in uh, buying residential homes a year or so ago. Yeah, so, so I, yeah. I'm telling you, based on the charts that I see, uh, based on the charts that I see, the advice of this realtor, which, you know, sounds like investment advice, but this, the, the advice from this guy is not, I don't, I, don't, I mean, that's a big if. If rates get down below six, they might, but how long do they stay there, right? Because I, if they do, I don't, you know, if we got inflation, these things are, the patterns are the patterns. So, so we'll see. We'll, we'll cross that bridge in March. That six Say that again? is not treasury six. That's 30 year mortgage rates, which mortgage. are right now at seven, yeah. eight, five, eight percent, somewhere around there. Yeah. So that's what he's saying gets below yeah. six. Yeah. So he, like the 10 year would have to be below three and a half. Like right. for for his thesis to come out, the ten year would see three and a half, which is funny because that's a part of support, right? So it's going to be tough for this market to get below three and a half. I could see it getting down to three, and he might be right for a couple months. Um, but either way, um, you know, you're not buying a house for a couple months at these prices. Well, I'm sure, Patrick. So let's you're talk gonna, about. It. Let's wrap. You're going to talk about it in a minute, what's, what's but uh, you know, how many people who own a house are going to be selling their house when they got a mortgage at less than three? you know, to only go buy yeah. a house that's, you know, highly inflated at the present moment with the 8% mortgage. Well, the affordability is there. You can see it. So to even expand on that, you know, I have my, my brother's wife is selling her old house and I'm like, you know, I'd maybe be interested in buying that. But when I run the numbers based on interest rates, price of the house, and even though rental prices are going berserk, it still doesn't make sense. Like you can't make the numbers work out with what you'd have to pay unless you bought it all cash, which still wouldn't make really sense. Yeah. So it's just, yeah, there's the buyers are not there right now at these rates, even though, like we said, that we're at historic lows, you know, which people don't realize. Yeah. So as you guys, so here's a, here's a real life scenario that just happened to me As you guys know, my dad passed away in June. Um, the house we grew up in that was built in 1968 is in Lake Forest, and it has the original kitchen, original bathrooms. Um, you know, my, my dad kept it all this time, never did anything. I mean, it needs a fence. It needs a roof. I mean, this is a fixer. OK, um, we, I, I list the house uh, within five or six days, got six offers, all three of them below asking, three of them above asking every offer from an LLC, not, not one real person. We, we had probably 20 people come view it. My realtor reached out to all the other people who didn't give us an offer and asked them, do you have a real buyer? Do you have a person? Do you have a family? None, everybody who came and saw it and made an offer was an LLC. The six offers that we got, three of them were Chinese LLCs. So, you know, whatever people are saying, China's slowing down. If it is, they're getting their money out because it's coming to Lake Forest. Um, and this is a trend, you know. So it, it, I have been believing for a while when it comes to real estate that the first, you know, dip, the, you know, little plateau that we had last year, 
got jumped on and bought by all the cash buyers. All the guys that thought they had missed the last move jumped on the first little dip in prices. And there's still a lot of cash buyers. There's still a lot of these LLCs out there. There's, you know, and whoever they're being supported by. Um, once you run out of those, once you run out of those cash buyers, which that there's a limited pool there, they only got so much cash. And the moment that those guys take a burn on the whatever next house that is, because eventually when the music stops, they'll get burned and they'll stop flipping. Right. So we haven't gotten there yet by what I experienced. Um, but I can tell you the average Joe does not seem to be participating in the real estate market unless maybe they're getting a job transfer or they're forced to. Um, so when I look at IYR, which is, you know, a stock market investment, you know, like ETF that, that tracks traded real estate, I have learned over the years that it tends to lead what we tend to see in the future in real estate. And this has been soft and down ever since 2022. Um, and it sure does look like it wants to break this level of support. And so if the stock market is supposed to be kind of like a forward looking discounting indicator, right, then this is telling me that the future of real estate prices is most likely going to cool down, especially if you get higher rates. All right. And, and you have all these affordability things. It just we, we I don't think we've been at these rates long enough to break the back of the trend that was already there. Um, but I think we're getting there. So I would like, if I were a real estate person, I wouldn't be chasing prices. I'd go back to the, what we talked about back in March and April, where, you know, you, you make your offers lowball um, and be patient unless well, you have to, you know, have a house, you know. Like, like Justin said, I mean, people are, you know, it's why the, for the most part, you know, we kind of crossed over a little bit of it, the inflation, but most people are not feeling the pinch of the rising interest rates. You know, now they're starting, some are starting to, but because they're locked into the 30%, you know, the 3%. So why sell a 3% to get into an 8%? And, yeah. you know, the, the China slowing down, I, I still think that that's happening. There's, there's plenty of cracks in that system and people are jumping ship and coming here to, to park their money. And that's just, you know, besides oil prices, which have a huge effect on inflation, I think if that supply chain gets cut off, that's going to be another, you know, bump up to inflation. Yeah. But until we see unemployment tick up, which I don't think we're going to have happen for a while, unless we get into a deep, deep recession, I don't see prices coming back down to, you know, normal levels. Will they soften? Will they flatten? You know, but yeah. are they going to dip drastically? I don't, I just don't see it. Yeah, it's hard for me with, with with the fundamental demand that millennials will have for housing, for starter houses. You know, guys like Justin who got married and now will go ruin a good marriage by having kids. They'll need a house and things like that, right? So the that that's not going to – and there's a lot of Justins out there um, and and behind him even more. So I, it's hard for me. I agree, agree with you. I don't expect a crash. Like, like they see the, the two big components of real estate are interest rates and employment. So now we pushed interest rates higher and we haven't crashed. We got soft on some in employment earlier this year, especially in Silicon Valley, places like that. Um, but without more layoffs or without something seriously happening there, and it, it's hard to see how real estate collapses. It might get, get it, it might, um, it, it might go sideways. It may not be the best investment. I mean, I could see where in five or six years we look back and go, "Geez, real estate hasn't done shit in the last five years." Right? And um, and unfortunately, now it doesn't yield much. Still, like I mean, when you when I did when I did the math to either keep my dad's house and rent it or sell it. Um, you know, it didn't make sense because I could take the money, I could park it in a treasury and get five and a half percent, whereas my cash flow on the rental after the change in taxes and this, that, the other thing was going to be less than three percent. So, you know, um, there's a lot of people in, in, in doing that analysis. So I think you're right. It, it gets soft, but I don't expect a crash. No, you, you if my mind about, changes, I'll tell you. I know you've talked about the, uh, you know, unemployment being a, a big factor in prices of real estate and stuff like that. Do you guys think there's any um, relevance for like the wage wage gap 
to how much homes yeah. are, you know, costing and the ability to, you know, uh, yeah, even if even if prices come down, if people aren't making more and housing is still somewhat elevated, you know, I think there's a, a potential problem there with, you know, yes, maybe we don't have the yeah. employment numbers we did of 2008 or 2009. <laughs> Um, but if nobody's really making much more and rents are going higher, mortgages are going higher, um, you know. Yeah, that 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 factor, I think, we'll see in in regional numbers like, you know, like I think you're on to something there, Justin, we'll see that develop over time. Um, but that's then when you hear the story of real estate is regional, um, because like you might have one region that doesn't have any layoffs. You know, like for instance, right now with all the auto stuff going on. So, you know, we, we've seen this in the past where you might have one industry that goes through a big layoff. And so any of the regions that have a lot of those types of employees, yeah, their housing market gets hit, but not another. Um, so now, you know, the employment, the, the wage gap factor will start to affect the regionality you know so if you're a real estate investor and you just have to invest in real estate then you got to start now it, you know your your search becomes very narrow because you're looking for markets that you know that that owning is still better than renting and and there's only a handful of those now um and so it's just a, it, 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 that's the whole goal of the fed inflation is only successful if you can push rents and housing prices higher because that's the way you take money out of people's pockets other than energy and food right and so they're there I mean, they've been pushing and but they haven't broke it yet we're you know we haven't finished this cycle yet and that means that you know bottom line that's why because we haven't finished the cycle why we remain underweight equities equities do best when the government's trying to grow the economy not slow it down you know simple facts there right so we want to be underweight equities based on everything that we've seen we'll come back to them if the charts start going in, in the right direction we'll come back to them but there's a lot of ways we can hedge that and we can there's a lot of ways we can make money with the stock market going down um and you know we continue to be overweight cash because it's interest bearing now we actually make some money on cash or treasuries or you know, cash equivalents metals we are overweight um but you know they better start moving really soon energy we've been overweight and we're starting to trim it back um but we like that long term and this is really the time that you got to know all your alternatives whether you're in a 401k whether you're investing in a brokerage account whatever it is this is the time to understand the fundamentals have changed. This isn't the 90s. This isn't the 2000s. This isn't the 2020s. This is more like the 1970s. So your portfolio is going to need to reflect that. And the time to do that is now because we're starting to run out of time um, for people to know their alternatives. And we've been talking about this for a year, year and a half. So if you haven't acted by now, shame on you. So if you're a quiver client, all right, nothing you need to do. Just if you're curious about what's causing the portfolio to go up and down in value right now, track the price of oil and gold and silver and what's going on in interest rates. Those are the things that are moving our values around day by day. Now realize we're on top of this. We'll change it if it needs to be. If you're not a quiver client, this is when you need to know your alternatives. You need to be calling us. You need to be calling Patrick. You need to be calling Justin and saying, hey, guys. What are my options? I got this 401k. What can I do with it? Hey, I, I've got some old investments that I've been sitting on. I got money in the bank. What what are what are things that I can do to fight this inflation? Because it's going to continue to pick your pocket and it's probably going to get worse if our charts are right. So, Justin, Patrick, let's wrap it up. Do you guys have anything you want to add to that? Um, I mean, as far as knowing the alternatives, obviously, you guys know I love the alternatives, you know, much more. You are the alternative guy. But even with, because like we said, we can get 5% on our cash. You know, you can get a bond right now, a 30 year bond and get 7%. You know, for, for certain types of people right now, there's so many options to get your income to the alternatives usually give you that it's, there's, it's just a plethora. It's not even just alternatives. There's things that you know and understand to where you can get that yield to where it doesn't have to be something new that we're teaching on. And I'm actually teaching clients that love alternatives that 
we don't need your Russian alternatives right now because you can get so much yep. on your cash and cash alternative yep. type of things that it's it's yeah. a wait and see type of game. That's a short term play. You know, it's not a long term type of thing for cash right now, but it's still there's no rush. Yeah, unless you're if you in got equity, cash, that's is great. Rush. <laughs> but yeah, if you're if you're in equities, you need to move and start asking questions quickly, right? Depending upon what your goals are. If you're 20, 30 years old, maybe not. I mean, most of what we're talking about is for people that are in their 50s and 60s. That like, if right. you're five years away from retirement, or you're five years away from needing your money for healthcare or whatever it is, that's what this advice is really designed for. It's not designed for the 20 year old or 30 year old. This what we're talking about is people who you know don't have 30 years to recover from a bad year right so that's that's the big key factor there is where are you in life um and reach out to us and let us ask you some questions like that before you ever make any decisions so then we can tell you what parts of this really matter to your life and what parts don't um because everybody's situation is, is different we're not going to be like that real oh. estate agent where we say now is the time to buy. <laughs> oh, you're not going to you're not going to be sending me Zillow generated uh, uh, advice. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. Well, I'm assuming Justin, do you have anything else you want to throw in there? Or are you happy with what we just got done there? I'm happy with what we just got done there. Um, I guess one one <laughs> quick thing would be uh, for those that. Um, Yes, if you have your own 401k individually with your company and you're looking to optimize it, please give us a call. We can at least uh, help you within the system that you're already in. If you're a business owner, we do offer 401k plans. And I know from the ones that I've been reviewing this year, a lot of the 401k plans that most of these small business owners have set up um, lost you know, 20, 15 to 25% of their value last year whereas our business owner yeah, clients crazy. you know we're in a positive situation so and this year same th same thing so if you are a business owner you need a 401k or you have questions around that please give us a call because we have just like we do with everything we talked about here extensive knowledge on getting that set up for you managing it for you talking with each individual employee and that kind of stuffing and sharing the services and tools that we have available uh, for them all right well, well that's good. i think that's a good disclosures page yeah right there, disclosures page Oh, you want you want to seal the disclosures some more? That's exciting. Well, well yeah, because that that has our phone number and email address. Because oh, it has our phone number and our website. <laughs> yeah, quiverfinancial.com, folks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're the only guy who's below, ever wanted to say, "Hey, can blind. we can we stare at, can we stare at the disclosure page for a few hours?" <laughs> All right, well, it's the end of summer, beginning of fall, folks. So enjoy the change in weather. And uh, we'll be back in touch with uh, more updates as the year unfolds. And uh, thanks for joining us. All right, guys, let's get out of here. Got a little countdown.